over there. Our first speaker today is Brendan Cottaboy, who's going to talk about the fascinating relationship between Centos and Rel and Fedora, uh, which is one of the most frequent questions we get at, uh, at various conferences, is why do you have three of these? And uh, Brendan is going to make everything clear. Normally I would say no pressure, but actually that's true. All right, so let's get started. Uh, my name is Brendan Conaboy. My title at Red Hat is RHEL Development Coordinator. And that basically means that I make new things happen that we haven't done in RHEL before. So let's see here. Uh, I've been at Red Hat for 19 years, and that gives me a kind of unique perspective on a lot of things, particularly why are things the way they are? And I thought for the next few minutes, we could just talk about a, a well-known Red Hat internal thing called Memo List, which is where everybody talks to everybody. So back in 2003, everybody was talking to everybody about community. At that point in time, uh, Mandrake Linux had just kind of decommitted from part of their uh, operating system, they're like, well, we can't really do this commercially anymore, so we're going to make it a community project. This was for the uh, AXP, that's the, the original Alpha Multia, long, long ago. And one of the Red Hatters said, hey, I wonder if we should think about having some sort of community thing. Because at this point in time, Red Hat Linux was in play, Red Hat Enterprise Linux was in play. They were both going at the same time, and energy that was going into Red Hat Linux previously was going into RHEL, and RHEL was kind of losing popularity. So like Harris said, well, we should think about this. And somebody else said, well, what would we do together? And another person said, hey, this is, things are already happening here. There's this thing called Fedora.us, which, which was like run by Warren Tagomi and Matthew Miller way back when. And Havoc Pennington piped in, well, what does community even mean? Because remember, at this point in time, this was a long time ago. We didn't know what community meant. We didn't know how to do it. Community had, had primarily just been, there are these people that use the operating system and they file bugzillas. And uh, that was kind of like a community, but it's not where we are today, right? So how did we get from there to here? So Alan Cox piped in, like, these are the titans of my era. I hope for, for you, you know some of these names, but others, uh, the titans of your era are, are probably people you know right now and you just don't know that they're the titans yet. And Ellen just said, we need to make it possible for people to do things, not for us to do the things for them. And the conversation, as often happens with engineers, quickly descended into, let's figure out all of the details here and now. Uh, and 15 years later, we have Fedora, Rel, and CentOS. And that's not to say that the results of MemoList were what caused Fedora to happen. What actually caused it to happen were a few people that decided that this was a good idea that kind of did the work. And it was a lot of work to create Fedora. And when Fedora started, when the partnership between the Fedora.us and Red Hat was announced some six, nine months later, it was still several years before we even got to the point where a person who wasn't a Red Hatter could contribute to parts of the distribution that Red Hat considered sensitive. It was a long journey. So where have we ended up? Most people think the Red Hat relationship looks like this. We go from Fedora to RHEL to CentOS, right? That's, that's the straightforward thing that we tell everybody. And that's, that's sometimes kind of true, uh, <laughs> but it's also kind of misleading. So let's go into each one of these with a little detail. So Fedora is, is, to some extent, RHEL's upstream, but actually there are thousands of upstreams. There are like 21,750 packages in Fedora today, and that's like source components, not just binaries, but the actual sources that produce many binaries. So Fedora is that place where all of these upstreams converge, and we make a Linux distribution from that, which is packages and repos and ISOs and images and those are, those are like the artifacts of what the community produces. And from those artifacts, we produce additions and spins and tools and like desktop and IoT and Apple, which is very popular. 
And those are just the collections or the focused artifacts that, that Fedora produces. But what makes Fedora actually valuable, because it's not just these artifacts, it's actually the people that, that are using this, that care about this, that are solving their problems with it. And that's, those are people like the maintainers, the release engineers, the doc writers, the QA uh, participants, and the users, you know, basically the community. Uh, this is coincidentally the community from last week's flock, or at least about half of them, because we took the picture on the last day, and a lot of people had already left. So the value proposition of Fedora is collaboration, innovation, solutions, but Fedora itself is the users, it is the contributors. And so all of those things come together and Fedora creates an innovative platform for hardware, clouds, and containers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You probably already know this, but um, where does that go? So if, we, if we're gonna go with the stream analogy, Rail is this further downstream, it's beautiful, it's painted red. It's time lapsed because it's a little slow. So, <laughs> what is RHEL? So, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is a distribution developed by Red Hat and targeted toward the commercial market. That's what Wikipedia says. It, actually, that's pretty true. I, was, I tried to come up with a better, succinct way of putting it, but that's well, really good. But what does it actually mean? So, it's a long-term supported operating system. Fedora releases are supported for two release cycles plus one month. Each release cycle is six months long. So you install Fedora today, 13 months later, it is, it is out of uh, support. So you have to kind of keep going with the churn. Uh, in RHEL, when we make an operating system, it's supported for 10 years. Um, individual updates you can buy extended support on so you can live on 7.3 for the next several years. And there's extended life support that goes beyond 10 years. So there's all kinds of options. So it's for for people that really care a lot about security, performance, and stability, because those are the things we care about uh, inside Red Hat, because that's, that's what our customers care about. So the other thing that's a little bit different about RHEL is that while Fedora is made by community contributors, uh, we actually co-develop it with our hardware and software partners. So when a uh, RHEL release comes out, it's already been through multiple uh, QA cycles with Intel, with IBM, with HP, with Dell, uh, and likewise with software partners, you know, SAP, Oracle, you know, the, the big ones that made RHEL kind of famous and successful. And then RHEL itself is the foundation for all the rest of Red Hat's commercial uh, product portfolio. So we have a lot of other products besides RHEL these days, but the thing that connects all of them together is RHEL. So what is actually making RHEL valuable? versus Fedora, well, it's enterprise versus kind of that fast moving. So if you're a sysadmin, you spend less time on churn. Uh, it's very stable versus getting features. So once you get things working, you can leave it alone. And in those rare instances where we do have to make changes to RHEL, uh, we make the smallest changes possible. Rather, like we'll backport from upstream, but we won't rebase from upstream. So we make the smallest change that we can. So earlier I said it was a little misleading that that you know, it goes from Fedora to RHEL to CentOS. It's true that it does, but it's not like it's a, it's a whole transfer. So the, the last time we did this, 13% of Fedora packages became RHEL packages. So 20 something thousand in Fedora, about 3,000 in RHEL 7. And, and that's for the user space. And this is fine because there's, there's a lot more to Fedora. There's a lot more the community cares about than Red Hat cares about. And Fedora is a place for communities to experiment and do the things that they find valuable. And sometimes we find value in it too. So we took 13% of Fedora and made RHEL 7. Uh, but the last time we did it was actually 2014. So there's, there's some room for improvement there. And speaking of room for improvement, where does the RHEL kernel come from? It does not come from Fedora. It actually comes from kernel.org. We take the kernel spec file from Fedora and then we kind of forget about any connection between the Fedora community and the, the RHEL kernel community. That it, so that means that the main component between Fedora and RHEL is not shared right now. And that, that is a shame because it, it kind of makes Fedora less significant than one might think. Which leads us to CentOS, which you're all here for. And uh, CentOS is a simple rebuild of RHEL. Uh, if you've never seen this graphic before, the more you look at it, the more nightmarish it becomes. And if you've ever uh, run into one of the release engineers in, in CentOS, you know, shake their hand, buy them a drink, 
it is not easy to simply rebuild packages that, that come from RHEL. It is, it is a lot of work. And it's usually good enough. It's, it's an approximate. It's a pretty good approximation. So what makes CentOS most valuable is that approximation of, of all the things that make RHEL valuable, plus a couple other things. It's free. We love that, right? Uh, although RHEL is also free by the developer program. And more importantly, more important to me, is the community, especially the special interest groups. Speaking of which, Ricardo Martinelli is talking about the past SIG after me. So we'll learn more kind of hands-on about SIGs in an hour or so. So I want to, I know this is kind of like a time frame back and forth thing, but when we were in 2013, again, the Linux distro was king, right? There, there were not all these other products. We didn't have OpenShift. We didn't have Kubernetes or we might have had satellite, but we didn't have very many things. So let's talk about where we are now. So we have physical hardware. That hasn't changed. And we have an operating system that runs on the physical hardware. That's, that's pretty normal. But what's happened since 20, 2003? Well, we added like virtual hardware. So KVM, Zen, VMware. Uh, and then we have a virtual hardware OS. Often this is the same thing as the physical hardware, but not necessarily. And then we, on top of that virtual hardware OS, or you know, sometimes when it's the same thing, we have container orchestration like OpenShift. And uh, on top of that, we then have application libraries and stacks, user space. So all the things that are read here are kind of nominally what is operating system. And you can see that it isn't this, this concise thing anymore. It's actually, we've got a lot of kind of things in between these days. And then at the very top of that stack is a container application or it doesn't have to be a container application. It could just be something running on user space. But basically, we've gone from there's this operating system, there's this distribution, to there's a seven-layer stack of things that come together that, are, that some people use. And some people use all seven. Some people use three. But there are a lot more options than there used to be. It's a lot more complicated than it used to be. So let's, let's talk about some applied uh, things here. So on the hardware side, x86-64, for instance, that usually comes from hardware partners and OEMs. The, the OS that we generally support all that stuff on is RHEL. Uh, our, our virtualization layer is often Rev, sometimes OpenStack, which uses Rev. Uh, and then that guest operating system is, is RHEL, or now CoreOS, uh, also Container Linux, as was, or Atomic, as was. And for orchestration, we have OpenShift, for application libraries, that's, that's kind of the value proposition of containers, right? Is that uh, you could have anything running there. So it could be RHEL, it could be, it could be Fedora, it could be CentOS. And then the application is you know, something somebody built. So that could have been built with OpenShift's S to I. It could be a customer application. It could be something that you're developing that you just kind of want to run in a container somewhere. So not to put too fine a point on it, but when we talk about Fedora, CentOS, and RHEL, how does that actually relate to Red Hat's portfolio? RHEL is only one of Red Hat's 26 major product lines right now. Back in the day, it was like one of two. So what do the other 25 use as an upstream? Mostly CentOS. So I, I kind of, as an old timer, I found this, I was incredulous, right? Because you know, Fedora is the upstream for Red Hat. But it's not actually, it's just, it's one of many upstreams for Red Hat. So when we looked at it, RHEL inherits from Fedora, plus some other upstream projects. But OpenStack is RDO and CentOS. Rev, Overt and CentOS. OpenShift Container Platform, OKD, in RHEL and CentOS. Uh, Ceph, Ceph uses Ubuntu. Uh, we need to talk to them about that. And then, <laughs> Uh, uh, Gluster just uses everything. We just looked at the installation guides and, and how to work, and, and this is what they said, go here. This is, this is the place to do your thing. This is, as a community, this is where we work. This is our foundation. So why is that? Uh, the reason, of course, is that, that CentOS has a lot of the real value proposition if you're a developer. It is enterprise versus fast moving. It is stable versus features. It is backports versus upstream and special interest groups. and. Coincidentally, this slide is, was for the flock last week. 
And so it's a little bit of a reality check for anybody who's involved in Fedora. Why not Fedora? It's, all, it's because of all the choices that the Fedora community has made, or in some cases had made for them, uh, to, to be fast moving. And so we, we end up with a situation where the Fedora community and its output is very valuable, and CentOS and its output is very valuable, yet they are distinct, and it's kind of confusing. So what are, what are the things that make it confusing? What are the problems that we have? So the first one is that the Fedora kernel and the RHEL kernel, and by extension the CentOS kernel, are unrelated to each other. There is, there's no relationship there, and so there's not a lot, of, a lot of shared value. And at the end of the day, what we want to do is have one, one simple, consistent answer we can give to everybody on where to go, how to contribute, how to get value, how to share, because that is, that is the value of community, right? So problems, Fedora kernel, rel kernel, different communities, that's a shame. Also, Fedora releases are valuable to individuals, they're valuable to me, they're what's running this laptop and, and probably a lot of your laptops, but kind of a lot of those minor updates, a lot of the things that happened since 2014 in Fedora haven't happened in rel today. So not only are, is there less business value, but there's less technical value from Fedora than you might think because all of the cool stuff that's landed in Fedora, we've only taken a fraction of it into RHEL. And so in CentOS, you've only inherited a fraction of what's actually happened upstream. And we, we try to curate it to be the most valuable things, but what's valuable to, to RHEL might not be valuable to you as a CentOS user or community. So there's room for improvement there. And then, uh, as I mentioned, Red Hat partners with, with hardware partners to produce RHEL, but they just work with, directly with us. They don't work in Fedora. They don't work in CentOS. They're, there isn't really a relationship there. And so Red Hat ends up being this nexus when it would, better, it would be a lot better, it would be a lot more functional if we were just kind of one big happy family that were, that were working together. And then finally, most of Red Hat's product portfolio uses CentOS, not Fedora, as a foundation. And that just reduces the value of Fedora. And it also puts CentOS in this kind of awkward situation where it's the downstream, but it's the upstream. So you know, when you sum it all up, there's no clear answer on where users, developers, partners, ISVs, or any other kind of company or individual can actually go and participate in, in Red Hat community's sphere or tent or what have you. So we started with this view, that you go from Fedora Linux to RHEL to CentOS, and it's appealing, it's simple, it's false. This is the reality. <laughs> it, it is that sometimes RHEL inherits from Fedora, but sometimes Red Hat inherits from CentOS because of SIG work primarily. And it's, it's a little confusing. You can't use an MC Escher uh, waterfall to explain to people where to participate. They don't know where to start, but it is fun to look at. So it doesn't have to be this way. So we've been working on a few uh, technologies to make things better, to, to kind of simplify this. And the question is, will they be adopted? So let's revisit Linux distributions. Uh, back in the day, Linux distributions were the coolest thing. And the reason they exist in the first place was that Unix as a whole was, it had good ideas, but people didn't have quite the features they wanted, things didn't work quite the right way. And so by and by, everybody wrote a replacement for one part of their Unix OS or another. And eventually, every single part of what was in Unix had been rewritten with something better. That's where GNU came from. Uh, the Linux kernel was kind of the, the, the linchpin for it all. And the distribution was simply the amalgamation of all of the things that people had written and shared and collaborated on. And, you know, licensing was weird in those days. We still had shareware. We had, you know, try it for non-commercial use. We had all sorts of things that had no basis in, in uh, <laughs> copyright law, at least in certain countries. So the question is, does the Linux distribution make sense? Does a distribution make sense or does something else make sense? So let's look at what's happening elsewhere in the computer world. Um, Windows doesn't have a distribution. They have an operating system, and they will sell you applications. Uh, Mac OS, likewise, while they do have a community, while they do pull some things from 
their community, while there is a degree of back and forth, it is still fundamentally, we make an operating system, there is an ISV ecosystem, we work together, we have a good unified thing. Uh, and of course, iOS doesn't do this at all. Uh, when, when the iPhone came out, by and by, the, the developer's kind of mantra of Steve Ballmer before it became really, really real. Like, we've passed millions and millions of applications for, for our uh, iPhones, and not to mention our Android phones. Uh, there, there is one thing in common in all of these, and that is that the operating system is separate from the application, and that's, that's kind of hard to do but maybe we should be talking about separating the operating system from the applications also. Uh, we've been working on that, actually. So let's, let's talk about why. So operating systems, you need one to boot, but it's not the reason why you're booting your computer, unless you're me. I boot the operating system, uh, and when it boots successfully, I'm done. I'm ready to ship it. <laughs> but for most people, they actually just want to run an application, and the operating system is sort of besides the point. And operating systems have to have basic, basic features, basically enough to get the application running. Uh, operating systems can diverge from upstream a little bit more readily than, than an application can, because usually if you want an application, you want the latest and greatest. It's a thing that you're using. It's a thing that, that you're like, oh, I wish it had this one extra thing. And usually that one extra thing is in development. And if it's not in development, you can request it or you can do it yourself. It's like the power of open source. So. There's a little bit of different use cases. There's different needs between the OS and the application. And because there are different needs, maybe we should treat them a little bit differently. Maybe we should make a space for each of them so that we can have the OS we need for our use case with the applications we need for our use case. And there are so many problems with this. When you get into like the tangled web of dependencies, that come about, how do you know what is operating system? How do you know what is application? It's a matter of opinion. And it's okay for it to be a matter of opinion because it's okay to iterate when you're trying things out. Dependencies are complicated, but one of the things we've worked on for the last two, two and a half years in Fedora primarily is a thing that's been under the moniker of modularity. Hi, Langdon. The thing that modularity gets us, when you get right down to it, is a thing that we just call parallel availability, which is you can have two versions of the same package in the same namespace, and you get to choose which one you want. And what that means is that you can have an operating system that offers certain libraries, an application that requires certain libraries, and if there's an incompatibility between your operating system and your application, you can have the same library, but different versions available so that you can kind of treat modules as a, uh, as a differential. Do you know differential? It's when in a, a vehicle, wheels turn at the same rate. When you go around a corner, the wheels on the outside have to spin faster because they're going a little bit longer, and the differential is the thing that makes up that difference. So when we talk about splitting the operating system from the applications, the thing that's really prevented us from doing that effectively is a lack of differential and uh, modularity, parallel availability is the way that we can do that now that we didn't have the option before. So now that we have the option, uh, it will be up to the communities and Red Hat as a participant in those communities to try and make this work. And then finally, when you have parallel availability, the the QA matrix gets huge, right? Because every time you switch out one library, anything that depends on it, there's now two different uh, ways things could go wrong. And so the QA matrix gets really big. It, CI is no longer optional. It is, it is something that we fundamentally need, but it's something that we already needed. Like the technology stack, the 26 products, it's huge as it is already. So CI is the way that communities can can work together. It is, it is the contract that we make with one another to not break things. So let's say we were to split the operating system from the applications. Uh, there's another piece that, that kind of comes about from this, and that is that you can revisit the lifecycle question. Earlier I mentioned that Fedora is released every six months and supported for two releases plus one month, so about 13 months total on average. So if we split these in two, does that still make sense for the operating system and the applications? Does that make sense for RHEL? Does that make sense for CentOS? 
there's an opportunity here to reevaluate what is actually useful. So for me, for my use case, a lower speed, slower OS makes sense. That makes, it's good for my customer base. Um, and applications going faster, having a shorter lifespan, maybe even being continuous instead of release-based makes more sense. So again, we, we have a technology that can do this now. Uh, we would need to develop policy to do it with. But that is a thing that can be done. So what, what are we doing? What is Red Hat doing? We're doing four things that I can talk about. Uh, the first is that we're working to bring the Fedora and Rail kernel communities closer together. And I, I mentioned this here at, at the CentOS Dojo because I think the CentOS community should be part of that conversation as well. Like, there, there is nothing that Fedora does that CentOS shouldn't also be exploring the option of doing. So we're working on uniting the tribes. Number two, uh, there's this problem where RHEL doesn't inherit from Fedora very often. If we are able to split the operating system from the applications, then for my customers, I can pull the applications a lot more often. The operating system, it's still sacrosanct, but applications, my customers want them faster. Uh, Fedora customers want them faster. Uh, based on Apple use, CentOS customers <laughs> want them faster too. And you know, I'd, I'd even ask you, is it really valuable for there to be different applications in Fedora, RHEL, and CentOS, or is that something we could all share? I would say within, as we explore the possibility of separating the applications from the operating system, there is an opportunity to remove that differentiation because it isn't valuable for any of us. We'd be better off, I think, we'd be better off if we did it, if we all shared those same applications. Uh, Coincidentally, uh, this was a co-presentation at uh, Flock, and I totally don't remember the slide. <laughs> oh, and now I do. So one of the, one, what are the barriers to actually working closer together? One of them is that Fedora is its own infrastructure, and CentOS is its own infrastructure, and that each of them have really, really wonderful uh, infrastructure teams that are, that are maintaining it. They have rules, they have policies, uh, but they have different account credentials, they have different data centers. Uh, one of the things that's happening right now is inside Red Hat, we've merged our infrastructure crews together, so it's all one team that's supporting both. And instead of having just one team with one set of infrastructure, we now have redundancy. And other moves are being made so that if you are a contributor in one of those communities, it is easier to be a contributor in another. So depending on what you want out of your operating system or your distribution, assuming we still have one, uh, it's easier to choose where you do your work or what you run and go between the two more interchangeably. That's not to say that we're completely merging communities. Each, each community has its own place, its own value, the, the reasons why you're here are different than the reasons why Fedora people are doing their thing, and we, we think it's important to honor those and let, let the communities kind of explore what works best for them, but we want to at least make it easier to, to share, to you know, cross the fence, make it not a climb, but just a step. And then finally, uh, CentOS has great CI, it's what it's what so many of the layered products are actually using. It's one of the values to them. So we're trying to get that into Fedora as well, uh, real gating CI, so that uh, if we do split applications, if we do share them uh, amongst each other, that we don't inadvertently cause regressions or like, reduce the value you get as a user or increase your frustration as a maintainer or a developer. Um, ultimately, we want to make things better uh, and not in a two steps forward, one step back kind of way. But that is just what Red Hat is doing. And the question is, what about the community? So back to that memo list thread. Uh, this, this is the one that really stuck with me. It was by Rick Van Reel. It's funny, a lot of the people that, that kind of shaped all this are, are no longer at Red Hat. They're, they're still out there, but they've moved on to other things. Uh, Rick said, personally, I'm convinced the biggest value of a community-based distro would be the community and everything made available by the community. The basis made available by us is just a platform on which the community can flourish. So 
I thought it was pretty insightful. Like, does, does everybody, what do you think? Is that, is that good? So basically we have some opportunities now that we didn't have before to serve more people, to grow a bigger community. And uh, if, if we go in this direction, it will be a lot easier to provide a clear answer on where users, developers, partners, ISVs, anybody should participate in the kind of Red Hat communities, in the CentOS community, in the Fedora community, because the answer can be consistently the same. And the technology work that makes this possible is already happening, and this is a thing you can join in. Again, uh, I think a lot of the time the uh, CentOS is viewed a little bit too much as a downstream and not as a place that you can experiment, that you can be part of the upstream. And clearly that's not true for, for some of the products that live on top, but also just anything that you've ever wanted to be in Fedora, you've ever wanted to inherit through RHEL, that is a thing that you can do now that we just haven't really talked about it much. So uh, I just wanna end by saying that we don't actually have all the answers, these are we're creating opportunities and it's, it's actually up to each community, the people in each community, to, to make the best choices. Like uh, the, the memo list thread from 15 years ago, uh, those people are titans to me. Uh, some of you are probably the titans of, of right now or five years from now or two months from now. Um, so in other words, today we have a Penrose Triangle. I forgot to mention this earlier. I was looking for a three-sided Mobius strip and I just couldn't find one. This was the closest approximation I could find. If you follow it, if you just don't think about the hole, you follow that blue line around, you know that's going backwards and we're probably at green and then it comes around and it's just hard to explain. It's really hard to explain the relationship between Rail Fedora and CentOS. You need to have a, a 30 minute presentation just to do that. but if we can make the operating system and the applications distinct, if we can share and uh, like work together, then we can get to a two-sided uh, Mobius strip, the classic Mobius strip, where one side is you know, what Red Hat is doing for its business and what the other side is doing is what, what you as uh, community members wish to do, where you want to take it, it's up to you. And, and that's it. So, questions? Oh, Go ahead. Oh, so one question that, um, I don't know if you can answer or not, but maybe you can give something to it. Uh, so I use both, all, I use all three quite a lot. Um, um, the next question I have is why is the rel so Fedora is incredibly open and transparent about everything that's happening. And I understand as a commercial business, maybe Red Hat wouldn't want that for RHEL, but RHEL seems to be unnecessarily secretive as to what's in the next release, what's coming down, what's happening. I mean, if you pay attention to Fedora, you pretty much know where Red Hat's going anyway, but what value is there in the secrecy? So, I am not a lawyer, but I would say that we are trailblazing every day at Red Hat. Like, from, from the moment Richard Stallman penned the, the first GPL forward, there has been a lot of fear and uncertainty and doubt. Uh, when, when the distributions conversation first came up 15 years ago, Remember that this was at the same time that SCO was saying that Linux was derived from, from SCO, actually, uh, in succession. So Red Hat always takes a very conservative approach where it could conceivably, in some edge condition, create liability. It's not, it's not the best choice. I mean, speaking as an engineer, I think it, it's terrible and that would never happen. But the company just takes a very conservative view on things that could create uh, liability, especially as a publicly traded company. There are all sorts of unintuitive uh, problems for anything that we say. Like there are, 
there are some things I can't talk about in this presentation that are very interesting to me and are part of my day job that I think, I should be able to talk about this. That doesn't make any sense. And it's just because we don't want to ever create a situation where there isn't a rel, where there isn't a fedora, where there isn't a community, uh, because it's, it's easy to slip up. I would refer everything else to Bex, who has more interaction with Red Hat Legal. <laughs> All right, other questions? In the blue shirt. So I guess what you're saying is that if you were to say, oh, we're working on this feature and well, we can't guarantee it comes out, and then it doesn't come out in the next release, that could create those problems? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there, I, as a presenter, we get a couple of very clear guidelines don't talk about product schedule or product features because you don't know until the very end if they're going to go in. Hi, I have two questions if that's okay. Please. Um, one is specifically to um, the, the balance between the two communities of, of Fedora and CentOS, it has long not necessarily made any sense to me other than historical reasons as to why Apple is in the Fedora community. Is there any plans to um, do anything about that? Definitely, maybe. So the reason why Apple is in Fedora is that the packages that come out of Apple are actually just based on Fedora branches. So even though they are uh, for CentOS and RHEL users, for that matter, very popular, uh, the, it's just an architectural kind of detail that doesn't really make sense. Clearly, the where we are today is not the way we would have designed it. But when we started this out, when we started thinking, let's have a community, we didn't even know what that meant. And so we have organically uh, gone forth, tied our shoelaces together with everybody else, and tripped forward for the last 15 years. And we've gotten really far, but it is, it's not quite the way we would have done it if we knew that we wanted to get here or, or to like where we want to get to right now based on where we are here. Uh, we wouldn't have designed it that way. Yeah, for the, for the recording, uh, Peter just said, also many of the package maintainers in Fedora are also the maintainers in Apple. So as a simple matter of convenience, it is the case that they can maintain the package in Fedora, switch branch, do the same thing in, in the Apple branch, and they're done. Uh, I will say, though, that we are working on merging the disk git servers and what that will mean eventually is that whether you are a maintainer in CentOS or in Fedora, it will just be a simple branch switch to decide which place you're working in. Fantastic. Also, thank you for um, welcoming ISVs. I consider myself as one of them as a Red Hat partner. Can you please explain a little more about how one would get involved to make sure that the technologies that they are integrating are indeed CentOS compatible as well as RHEL compatible? Could you give me an example? Well, um, my talk is a really excellent example at 11 o'clock, if I could just make a plug. But uh, what uh, I would like to do specifically is make sure that if I recommend a suite of free software that just so happens to be part of um, the RPMs that happen to be in the repos anyway, um, how can I basically slap the CentOS logo on it saying this is 100% ready for CentOS and also uh, as I can with RHEL in their developer program? Hmm. Well, let's, let's put that question to two because I can't speak to what the guidelines are for using a CentOS logo. 
but I can talk to the technology side. So as mentioned earlier, the, the CentOS is a rebuild of RHEL, and so if you build it for RHEL, the odds are pretty good it's going to work in CentOS as well. There, there are occasional exceptions to this where like the wrong code pathways are, are traversed, but overall, you have pretty good reliability. Uh, I should maybe just take a, a quick segue into what reliability means to me, because this is, this is a thing that we've been working on, and it, it kind of goes into the stream branching parallel availability thing. For me, there are four kinds of reliability that we have in an operating system. There is the, the classic kind, which is just, it doesn't crash and corrupt your data. But there's three others. The second one is you can install it the same way after update, after update. Like if you were provisioning, if you were using Kubernetes, if you're using OpenStack, you update the OS and it continues to provision successfully. Uh, a third one is that the commands that you run after an update continue to do the same thing. So you don't want to like, have the scripts that you've worked and trusted for the last 10 years suddenly break because a new update's come out. You think, you wrote it once, it should work forever. This is a thing that historically we haven't really done a good job of in the open source community at all, because we generally kind of bias toward is it objectively the correct behavior versus is this a behavior people rely upon? And then finally, the fourth stability is developer stability. Are the APIs and ABIs going to be reliable across updates or for that matter, across versions? And that is why we have stream branches. This is, this is how we propose to even do the versioning of them is to say, if we introduce a compatibility, whether it be a new major uh, uh, SO name bump or we change the uh, caller function inside the, the same uh, SO, shared library, shared object, uh, we end up with a different stream version so that you can, as an ISV, as a developer, choose which one you're going to depend upon. And the, the promise that we think we have to make as, at least as rel maintainers, is to check, did we break the library? Did we break the compatibility that ISVs depend on? And if so, we need to make a new stream branch to handle that situation so that you can stick with the version that you're using and other developers can move on to the new version. So we have tooling in place that does this today that is getting increasing use. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, uh, there is a a package called libabigail that, that does ABI checking and it is very, very detailed and we are actually using that internally to make sure that we do not break ISV applications during our updates and anything that we do in RHEL, this is actually also in Fedora, but anything we do in RHEL, CentOS will essentially inherit that. So that is where you can get your technical trust from. The, the badging, I'd have to defer to somebody like Rich. Did that answer the question? Thank you. Okay. Ooh, I think we're out of time. Any last quick question? Okay, last one and we'll wrap it up. So um, I know when CentOS, uh, when RHEL 7.0 came out and CentOS 7 came out, there was a very short amount of time between the two and I was, everybody was very impressed. But I've noticed that like the RHEL minor updates like 7.4 and 7.5 have been very big and it looks like CentOS, a CentOS minor release doesn't come out for like a month and a half. I'm not even sure, I'm not sure if the security updates within those minor releases wait, or, or the, have that wait of a long also, but like have, have these big minor RHEL releases been a big problem for CentOS? Mm, I would have to defer that to the infrastructure team. Uh, because I'm not involved in it, we definitely push the, the sources out at the same time that we always have. So it's just a question of how much time does the team have versus what they're trying to get done. Definitely the, the rel minor updates in the seven stream have been kind of bigger and more substantial than things than what came out in five and six. Like it is practically a new operating system every time for the amount of, of, of content we're pushing into a release. So you know, that, 
graphic I showed earlier with the impossible assembly, that is a thing that, that the team is having to work with every time. 